Hello and welcome. My name is Gracie Huerta. I am the Public Education Coordinator for the City of Santa Barbara Fire Department, Office of Emergency Services. Getting the important message out about disaster preparedness to as many Santa Barbara residents as possible is one of the top priorities for the City Fire Department. You are tuning in to the second episode of the four show series about disaster preparedness. We want you to get ready, Santa Barbara. So we hope that you are able to join us in the weeks to come to learn about some of the things that you can do to keep you and your family safe in the event of a disaster. These shows will leave you more prepared if you're faced with an emergency. If you're interested in more comprehensive training, the Santa Barbara City Fire Department conducts CERT four times a year. CERT will give you a hands-on opportunity to practice what you've seen on TV. If you're interested in bringing CERT to your workplace or neighborhood, give us a call at 564-5703. and uh, go ahead and just try dragging them that way. Dominique Blocker, a resident of Santa Barbara, will be working with our city firefighters throughout this series, helping us learn to apply these lessons to our everyday lives. Let's grab, okay. grab by the arm and just and pull it. In this show, we will be talking about and demonstrating the basic fundamentals of light search and rescue. Learning a few techniques can help you make a difference. They probably run more calls. To demonstrate this, we'll be joined by the crew of Truck One. They will show us that with common sense and a few fundamental concepts, you can play a vital role in a disaster situation. Let's find out how we can get ready, Santa Barbara. Dominique, hi, I'm Dave Aguilar. I work with Santa Barbara City Fire Department on the truck company. Nice and to meet you. Uh, it's, it's great to be here today and have this opportunity to share what we do in the city as a truck company. Um, on the truck company for Santa Barbara City, we, we carry a uh, a lot of equipment. We have three different uh, operations with two trucks and a heavy rescue. And on a day-to-day -day basis, you could have different personnel each day. So all the firefighters on the job are trained to be on the truck. Uh, all the captains are trained to be on the truck. Um, engineers are all trained to drive the truck and do those functions. But we do have specialty people that have special certifications for uh, heavy rescue and truck functions. And today with me, my normal crew on B-Shift. Um, this, of course, is Truck One. Uh, we also man the Heavy Rescue Squad. Um, and Tony Pagetti is the engineer. He's in charge of driving both apparatus. And he's in charge of making sure all the equipment is functional and working. And he provides the resources for us on all the calls. So uh, he's a very uh, important person um, as far as functioning as a truck company. Um, Barrett Hoffman, he's one of the firefighters on the truck. He also mans the rescue. Uh, he runs uh, many, many uh, rescue calls, uh, medical calls throughout the day in, in Station One's district. Um, and the rescue guys, they're probably the, the most important part of the truck company because they, they're versatile. They like do everything. They do all the heavy and hard work. Uh, they do all the lifting and moving. And uh, they really have to be uh, skilled at all the different functions that we do when it comes to truck functions and rescue functions. Wow. And then Matt Grit, he also works on the rescue. Um, How you doing? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. He, he does the same thing Firefighter Hoffman does every day, running medical calls. They're up all night most of the night. They probably run more calls than any of the engine companies in the city. And uh, they also uh, provide us with their expertise in uh, rescue functions and structure fire functions with the truck and heavy rescue. And of course, again, my name is Dave Aguilar. I'm the captain on B-Shift. Um, and fortunately for me, I get to be in charge of these guys. And, and they don't get a lot of supervision because they're, they're really good at their job. Anyways, it's great to be here today. And if you have any questions, Yeah, shoot. well, first off, this truck, I've seen it around town, but it looks different than the normal ones. It looks kind of difficult to drive and maneuver. Is that, is that true? Well, it's so long because, as you can see, we got a, uh, a big aerial on there, a big aerial ladder, so it and has to be long. That's this thing okay. up here, yeah, then, that's right? Yeah, a, that's a 90-foot aerial ladder wow. to get to higher elevations. Okay. Um, and as far as this truck goes, this driving goes, yeah. it's uh, actually probably the easiest apparatus to drive in the city. Really? Because we have a driver in the back. He kind of steers the back. And then Tony, the engineer, steers the front. And it's real maneuverable. Uh, it, we can turn in cul-de-sacs with it. And it's, it's actually the most fun apparatus to drive on.
don't have any expert training or big trucks, is there anything that I can do as just a normal resident to help out? The first and foremost thing is your safety. Uh, it's not so much of going into a, a structure or a situation. Uh, it's more looking at the outside picture. What kind of hazards do I have before I enter? What kind of hazards do I have before I put myself in danger? Okay. Okay. So I just I, I really need to use some common sense before just running into a collapsed building. You might want to do like a walk around. Okay. Start checking for hazards. Um, Start looking for best access inside. If you have to make an entry to save somebody, you might hear somebody's voice. You don't just go running in, you know, because now you may become a victim too. That's you have to start point. thinking thinking as a rescuer. And the first thing we talk about is rescuer safety. Myself. There are some basic things for a, for a layperson to to think about. You know, like first, um, what type of disaster is it? Okay. Fire, earthquake, flood car accident, whatever it may be. So what, are you, what kind of disaster are you going to? Second, what time of day is it? And, and why is that important? Well, at night, you might have more people in a house or in a structure than you would in the middle of the day or the middle of the week. So what time of day is it? What, what day of the week is it? You know, on a weekend day, there's more people that are moving around, people aren't at work. You know, you might have more victims in a, in a disaster like an earthquake. Okay. So, time of day, time of, day. Time of the week, Got it. and then the dynamics of a disaster, like what type? Uh, is it, does it involve a structure? So is it a single family residence? Is it a commercial building with multiple floors? Okay. Is it a building that has a sub-basement area? So those are things like you might want to dictate in your mind and maybe start taking notes. Now I've considered all the things about, you know, the time of day, the week, the environment, the disaster, things like that, and now I'm going to walk around the structure. Are there things that I should be doing or looking for while I'm, you know, kind of taking that lap around? Well, that lap around is is part of your part of your process of getting a plan a plan of attack. Okay. A plan for rescue. So, Captain, when when you show up on a call. Are there things that you would like to know from someone who is familiar with that building? Well, some of our best resources are uh, people that know the building better than us, you know, that work there every day, that, that do maintenance there, you know, like a maintenance worker or a building facilities manager or something. They know where most people hang out during certain times of business time. Uh, they know where all the exits are. Okay. Um, they know some of the important uh, hazards that are pertaining to that building. They know the layout of the building. So that, that's a great resource for us to find somebody who, who knows the building. Okay, so, so really if I can let the rescuer know, um, you know, where people might be hanging out, where people might be at, any dangers in the building, the layout of the building, um, and, you know, any damage that I know of. If, if I can let you know that, I'm going to be helpful. Yeah, that's going to be that's going to be really helpful because now that helps your your search methods. Are there things that are, are just going to be around me, or maybe I have in my car that that might actually be helpful um, in an emergency situation? Well, when you when you start thinking about a plan of attack, of course you're going to need some resources. You're going to need some equipment. Right. And of course. Somebody without experience or have a truck right there available with all the equipment on it, you're going to have to get a little creative. You're going to have to use some household stuff, stuff available in your car, like car jacks, um, any kind of pry tool. What's a pry tool? Well, a pry tool could be like any heavy, long handle that you could stick under something and, and actually use for a lever to like lift a heavy object. It might not just be one building. There might be four buildings in a row. So you might be do a quick walk around there and think, I think there's going to be more, more people trapped in this building. So as you're doing your walk around, you might want to start taking notes. You know, building number one, I, you know, I think is okay. There might be, you know, it's basically you're triaging the block or the, or the rescue process. Are these but, things that I'm going to want to share when, when the rescuers come? I'm going to want to tell them this information. Is that right? Well, there's, there's various ways to do that, but you as a as a first responder and not knowing anything about search and rescue, 
uh, taking notation of what you've done already is going to be real helpful. Okay. Like if you've already turned off the gas or if you've already contacted three other people in the neighborhood and gave them kind of an assignment to go check out another structure or another rescue. So every little thing that you do and you take notes of and you pass on to the first in company is going to be helpful for us to expedite a rescue. When I'm walking around, should I be calling for people or what about that? Can I can I kind of shout out? Most definitely or? want to call out. And if you can get a response, that's a viable rescue right there. You can con concentrate your efforts on a rescue right where you are. So now, since you've done your your mental size up and your walk around, you start thinking about what kind of resources do I need to, to make a rescue? Right. Um, how many people do I need to help me? Because again, um, your safety is the most important thing. You never want to go into a dangerous situation by yourself. You should at least have some backup. And that voice-to-voice -voice communication, whether it's rescuer to rescuer or rescuer to victim, is a, is a great resource to like plan, get a plan of attack. Okay, because I don't want to go in trying to help someone else, and then now I'm in danger too, and now the rescuers have two people to save instead of one. So you're right. I do need to think about that. That's a good point. If you can basically just do the walk around kind of size up and take some notes and maybe have some voice communication with somebody, that right there, you probably saved some people's lives, and you've not only helped firefighters, and rescue people come in and start a plan of attack, you probably saved it, maybe saved one of their lives because now they know some information before they go in. Like gas is leaking in that building. You know, if they know that right away, they may take care of the utilities. You could flag, you could flag a hazard, uh, take some flagging like a, like a, you know, a piece of plastic or a, or a rag or something and tie it to the door because it's going to look funny. Like, why did somebody tie that to the door? Well, somebody maybe already went in here. So, like, you know, there's certain things you can do. And, again, it depends on how big the disaster is and, and what the dynamic of that rescue actually is. So, so. there really are a lot, of, a lot of little simple things that I can do that will help in the end. How do I decide who I help first? Let's gear this towards a disaster because fire departments and rescue people are going to be delayed. Exactly. So, so you would look at it as like the, the lightest trap people. How many people can you save immediately? Like walk, walking wounded. Somebody's able to walk, but they're bleeding profusely. You may be able to walk, stop the bleeding, save their life. And we use the, the term triage. Okay. Right? So for an example, um, we got three buildings. One's a huge building and it's collapsed. Okay. And it seems like most of the people are going to be in there. And then we have another building over here that's collapsed. And we have another building over here that's collapsed. But it's a smaller building. It's something that somebody with no skills could probably go in and save one or two people. Oh, You're probably not going to save the 300 people over here that are trapped because you don't have the resources, you don't have the skill, but you're still able to come over and do something positive over here. What you're saying is even though I might want to rush into the building that, that looks the worst, it might be more effective for me to go into something that's not quite as bad because I might be more able to, to actually save some people in there. You're absolutely right. Now, again, we, we go back to where we first started. Your safety is the most important thing. Right. Okay? And for you to think, I want to rush into that building, that's, that's not a good thought process for a rescuer. That's where you have to stop, do your mental size up thing, and now think, like, where can I do the most good for the most amount of people? Okay. And that's where you, that's where you would start. And that's that, that smaller building that, that would be might the, not the be light as bad. Rescue. Right. In my head, not knowing, I might want to rush over to the, the building that looks the worst, but you're saying I'll probably be more effective by helping the people who might be less injured, but maybe I could lead them out of the building or something Absolutely. along those lines. And some okay. of those might become part of your rescue team. You're going to be much more effective, and you're going to meet the objective of a rescuer. You're saving the most amount of people and doing the most amount of good, doing the, the light rescue. So if I can just maybe lead some people out using my voice, then now I have a bigger team of, of people that can help save other lives. And you're absolutely right. My name is Barrett Hoffman. I work on the truck company and uh, today we're going to talk about uh, lifting heavy objects with the tools that you have. 
and the tools that we have and what we'd use. Uh, what was talked about earlier is pre-planning and, and uh, size up. Uh, part of your size up and pre-planning comes with, uh, you know, stuff that you can do around the house, and that would be uh, finding things that you can use, tools, um, and other equipment that you might need in the case of a disaster. Uh, in this case, we simulated it with uh, this uh, real life size 170 pound dummy uh, with its arm trapped underneath this 300 pound rock. And uh, most of us really have a hard time moving something like this, so we use tools and leverage uh, to make that happen. On our truck, we carry pry bars and we carry wood, which is called cribbing, and we'll talk about that later. But in this case, what I need to do is uh, create a fulcrum, uh, and that fulcrum will allow me to lift this heavy rock with just a mechanical advantage. Um, and in this case, like I said, this is what we carry on our rig. Um, this is something that if you're on a scene like this, you know, and it's a loved one, and, and you want to always uh, help a loved one out and, and, uh, or a neighbor, uh, in, in this case, if something like that happened and you want to get them out, uh, there's something you can do, and that's real easy by using this fulcrum and mechanical advantage. Uh, in this case, you'd use this uh, piece of cribbing, uh, you use this pry bar, uh, secure the cribbing, put the pry bar underneath, and just lift this enough to clear the arm. And you can see the arm moving now. Uh, this is just a demonstration. You might need to lift it higher normally, but sometimes that's all it takes, and the person get dragged out. If I need to go higher, and as Tony pointed out, this is the better way of doing it. And as far as, uh, you know, you not having this kind of equipment at your house, you know, you could pre-plan and keep something like this around, or you can use stuff that you already have. And in this case, I've got a, a cinder block and a garden tool. So these are things that I, I may actually have at my home. So yeah. I, I could use these and do what you just did? Absolutely. Okay. So, yeah, I might not have these. So now how could I use these? Well, these things aren't going to be as safe, um, so you got to really keep that in mind. Um, anytime we lift something heavy, we want to use cribbing. Um, and in this case, we've got a wedge on this side. That's, that's this piece of uh, wood right here. And if we lift up, we want to support what we lifted up. And that's basically what we call cribbing. So as we lift up, we can kick that underneath there w without putting our body parts in the way of the falling rock if it decides to fall. But we can support it so it won't fall anymore as we lift. And that's something when you're using tools that aren't designed for lifting that you're going to need to kind of think about when you do it. Okay. Because this, it, it might not be strong enough, right? It so might not. So that's why we kind of want to have a backup plan. Yeah. Okay. And just go slow and uh, kind of see if, it, if it'll let you do it. If not, um, then find another route of doing it. But in this case, it should work. So I've got a cinder block here and this garden tool handle. Um, doing the same thing. I've got a, a fulcrum and I've got something strong enough to lift up this rock. You know, it's not 250 pounds here, it's just right here where the center block meets the rock. Okay. So I'll do the same thing and just listen for cracking and all that. But as I lift, it may be just enough to pull this person out, and that's all you need in this case. Um, and then just remember when you're lifting, you want to slide something underneath it, whether it's more rocks, wood. Um, whatever will support that rock, that way it won't come down if it does break. Just go nice and slow, and you can see it's doing the same thing. It's lifting it up just enough to do it. And you can try it yourself. Maybe we'll, we'll uh, leave this here, and you and Diego can um, show what we can do to get this person out from underneath this rock. Do you really think I'm not as strong as you? You think I can move this Absolutely. Rock? I All think right. you can. Okay, let's see. So I've got this here, and I'm going to support it with my foot, right? Right. Slip this under. Right. And then Diego, are you ready? So I'm going to want to communicate with him the whole time, Absolutely. right? And Okay, so as soon as I, I'll let you know when it's lifting. Okay, here we go. Is that enough? More? We got it, and now he's clear, and I can. You can let it all the way down, and I'll put this block underneath if we don't want it to go down further. 
and that's it. Wow, See? it wasn't difficult at all. Yeah. Wow. Good job. Uh, thank you very much. So now if I found someone who I need to get out of this structure quickly, how would I move someone who's much bigger than me out? Well, there's a couple different techniques you can use uh, to make it easier to get him out of this building. Okay. Rugged Ron here, he's 175 pounds. You're petite compared to him, so it's going to be a little difficult, but a little more realistic. We got some debris that fell on top of him. He's not in a optimum position to drag out, so... To What's start the first with, thing? Yeah. To start with, let's uncover him. Okay. So you want to be kind of gentle with him, you know, just right. in case he's got injuries. Right. Should I be trying to talk to him at this Absolutely. time? Absolutely. The first thing you can do is talk to your patient. Let him know you're here. Let him know you're trying to help him out. So now we got the debris off the top of him. Right. Um, a lot of times, the first thing we want to do is patient assessment. Hey, you know, shake him. Shake and shout. Hey, Ron, Ron, you all right? Is he talking? Is he breathing? Right. Um, does he have any major injuries you can see, bleeding a lot? Does he have broken bones, you know, feet twisted the wrong way or a hand looking like it shouldn't be? Um, first thing we're going to do, we're going to assess the patient. Okay. So you've done that. Um, he's breathing. He's unconscious, but he looks in pretty good shape. Right. Okay. So, so now I want to get him out somehow? Now we want to get him out. Okay. First thing we're going to do is get him in a position where it's easier for you to drag him out because you're about half the size of him, so... You're going to need a little technique to get them out. You're not going right. to be able to pick them up and lift them. You're going to actually have to put them in a position and drag them out of here. Okay. What so, position is that? Uh, we want him flat on his back with his head facing the door. Okay. Do you want me to try? Absolutely. Okay. So, try to be careful. Wow, he is heavy. Okay. <laughs> so, I'm going to try to be careful with Ron. But I guess getting him out is more important than leaving him here for the structure to fall on Absolutely. Him, right? Say the structure is... Is not standing quite well, and it's uh, okay. it's going to fall down on top. And we want to get them out as soon as we can. Okay. So is that pretty straight, or that's, should I keep? No, that's perfect. Okay. All right. So now I got him on his back. You have him on his back, flat, and you right. have him in line with the direction you're going to you're going to drag him out. Okay. Exactly. So what you want to do is there's a couple different techniques. You can either bring both his arms up above his head. Okay. There we go, buddy. <laughs> and then grab both his wrists. Okay. And then I'm, am I going to be pulling him backwards? Or? And you're going to be pulling him backwards straight out of the building. Okay. Just oh, I like can that. do it. Yeah. It's not really that bad like this. Perfect. All right. There's one way. There's one way. I did the drag with his arms. Are there other ways that I could get him out of here? Uh, there are a few other techniques you could use. You did an excellent job with, with that drag. Um, we do have to keep in mind the most important thing is rescuer safety. So he's a big guy you want to make sure that you're using proper lifting techniques. And if you start to pick him up or start to drag him and you feel something hurt in your back or your legs, you want to let go, leave him where he is, and try a different technique. Okay, so so now say I couldn't do the arm pull. Is there something else that could give me a little bit more leverage with all of his body weight? Yeah, he's got a jacket on, so we'll try just grabbing the upper portion of the jacket right by his chest, okay. get a couple of good handfuls, okay. and just drag by that. Okay, and I want to bend down, right? So Absolutely. You know, straight back, use your legs. You're using a good lifting technique. Okay. And go ahead and drag straight back with them. All right. There you go. Well done. All my victims might not have a big jacket like this. Is there anything else I can do? There are. Uh, there is one more technique we'll show you, and that's using a, a blanket or a tarp. We call it a blanket drag. Okay. Um, you look at him, say he's wearing a T-shirt or a tank top, or he's got no shirt on. Nothing for you to grab a hold of, and he's too heavy for you to do just by the wrist. Right. So you look around in the shed, and you go, wow, hey, there's this wonderful green blanket just happens to be lying here. Perfect. But maybe I could use something like even a big towel or just Absolutely. something off the towel, tarp, like you said. Okay. Uh, there's a tarp right here. Um, there's a towel right there. Just stuff that's in the area. You okay. know, look around. Okay. So I'll give you the blanket here. All right. And what you want to do is same thing. Get him in the position where he's ready to go out the door. You want his head facing the right direction. Okay, so we've done that. So he's in line. You want to bring his arm in. You know, he's probably got his arm out here or on the side. Bring it in next to his side so you can roll him over easily. Okay, all right. So we've got that. I'm going to clear everything out of the way. Now, this is actually, it works a little better with two people, but you're a single rescuer, so we're still going to make it work. Okay. So what you want to do is spread your blanket out on the ground. Okay, do I want to open it all the you way? You want to open it up this? all the way. Okay, so I'm going to open it all the way. Maybe I can just lift his arm. All right. 
So try to get a little extra underneath there. And then okay. kneel on this side. Okay. What you want to do is lift his body weight over towards me. Over towards you. Okay. So I'm going to kind of get under his shoulder. There you go. Okay. And if you can lift him up and kind of get a knee underneath him. Oh, okay. I can do that. There you go. Got it. Should I bring the blanket and down And bring now? the blanket as far over as you can get it. Okay. Got it. Let me get down here. Okay. And now go ahead and roll him back down on the blanket. Okay. Perfect. And then pull him towards you. And do kind of the same thing. Oh, wow, hey, look, the blanket's all there. Look at that, okay. And now he's going to be on the blanket, basically. So now he's on the blanket. Okay, so then... Close the blanket up over him. Okay. All right. And then go ahead and grab two good handfuls of the blanket up here by the head. All right, so let me just wrap this. And wrap this one. All right, and, and now I'm going to just... With the same technique, using okay. a straight back, using your legs, okay. go ahead and pull them straight out. Oops, let me just grab again. That's okay. Perfect. There we go. That worked out nice really well. Warm. Those were some great tips. But now say we have someone, he's conscious, he can sit up, but maybe he has an injury to his legs or, uh, you know, his feet, and he can't walk out. Okay. Is there something else we can do for him? Absolutely. There's what we call either the chair drag or chair lift. Okay. Um, we'll have Firefighter Hoffman here be our victim. He's got an injury to a lower portion of his leg, but he's able to sit up in the chair and he's conscious and alert and talking to you. Okay. And uh, one of the most important things about the chair lift or chair drag is the structure stability of the chair. Right. We want a chair that's going to support his weight when you're dragging it across the floor or when you're lifting it. Okay. So, looking at this chair, it's, it's got steel contraction, it's got bolts in it, it's pretty well made, it'll support his weight. Right. But if you're using like an old wood chair, and you start to move him in it, and you hear the wood chair creaking, groaning, you don't want to use that chair, you're going to want to move him to a different chair. Right, we don't want to make him more injured than he already is right now, so, okay. Alright, so this is a sturdy chair. I, I have a partner that's going to help me get him out, what should we do first? Uh, you're going to need a partner on this, you can't do this, well, you could do it by yourself, but... We're concerned about his safety, and so we wanted him in, secure in the chair. You're going to want two people for this. Okay, so Diego's going to help me out again. So with Diego, what he wants to do is bring the person's arms in, kind of cross their arms. So that way that. their profile's not quite as wide, so when you're going through a hallway, they won't hit their elbows on stuff. Okay, that makes sense. And so he's got an injury on his legs, so you don't want to be careful of his injury. Diego wants to be down by his feet. He's going to grab the lower portion of the chair. Okay. He's also going to keep his arms around his knees to hold him actually into the chair. Okay. So, so just like that. And you're going to want to use your proper lifting technique. You don't want to come over with a bent back. You want a nice straight back when you lift up on it. Okay. Um, in this case, we're going to do a drag, so you won't be lifting all that much. And actually, his weight is going to be supported by the back legs of the chair. All right. So with so the go down there like this, you're so going to want to lean the weight back towards you. Okay. And a good technique is to get your leg out. Kind of bend it and bring the chair back right onto your thigh. Okay, so that's going to help support his weight, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Okay, how do you feel, Diego? Good? Okay, so now we're going to try to bring his back around? Yeah, we're, we're going to turn him around because it's going to be a little easier to get his head facing that way, his back facing that way. Whichever way is easiest to move him. Okay. Most of his weight's on this end, so you're going to want to drag it that way with his weight heading out. Okay, go ahead and lean back, Diego. Ready? So now we're going to go ahead and just go backwards. Now and you go ahead and go drag him straight back. All right. How do you feel, Diego? Good? Okay. As you can see, it's, it's a pretty easy technique to do, and it definitely supports his weight and gets him out of the building. So, Dominique, what I want to leave you with here today is when you have a plan of attack, you want to reevaluate that plan of attack. Always keep in mind what the rest of your safety is because you're the most important resource we have, and then reevaluate your plan again. Got it. I'll remember that. Thank you. There's a lot, then, that I, I can help you out with. I didn't Absolutely. think I could. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dominique, Captain Aguilar, and the crew of Truck One for helping to show how you can help the greatest number of people in the shortest amount of time. We ask you to help us get our message of preparedness out to as many people as possible. Encourage your friends and family to watch this program on City TV Channel 18 or watch it online at citytv18.com. 
Communicating with your family, friends, and neighbors, especially those who might need extra help, is extremely important. As a first responder, you'll need to help, and preparation can make the difference. Remember, pre-plan, prepare, survive. Thanks for watching.